And we're back, everybody. I got Jimmy to my right, and by, or excuse me, what I mean by back, we're back here with Jeff Sturgis from Whitetail Habitat Solutions. Just This is uh, Jeff's second time on the podcast. Uh, we podcasted previously with him about, you guessed it, Whitetail Habitat Solutions, a lot of habitat-related stuff. We covered a lot of ground in that, baby. Uh, so much so that, honestly, like, afterwards, like, it was like one of my favorites and there was so much information and my brain was going and getting twisted. It was a brain the bomber. En- the entire time. I hope that's a good thing. It was, it, it was it, great. <laughs> that is a really good thing. The, the amount, the amount of information in that podcast is like insurmountable. Basically. It, yeah. So if you could like white tales, book could be written. It, uh, yeah. I think Jeff probably has a book on it. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, if you want more information, buy Jeff's book. But also, if you want a lot of information, check that podcast out because it's definitely worthwhile. But we're going to chat a little bit today, and I'm going to let Jeff introduce himself here. Uh, more, less on whitetail habitat and how weather influences whitetail movement and how you as a hunter can use that type of information to essentially maybe cherry pick uh, your days to hunt or, or just hunt better on, on those good days. But, uh, I'm going to quit talking here. I'm going to let Jeff talk a little bit about himself. Uh, Jeff, please introduce yourself. I know you did on the podcast previously, but for the sake of this conversation, let's uh, let the listeners know, uh, who you are and what you're about. Well, it's always, uh, interesting, you know, talking about what I do, but it's kind of a multi, multifaceted, but I do write books. I have over 600 whitetail articles online on my website I'm whitetail crazy. You know, Mark, you talked about going uh, elk hunting pretty soon. I'd love to go elk hunting, but it's always at that whitetail time where I, I really can't wait to get out the woods <laughs> and whitetail hunt. And I know if I went, I'd love it. But um, writing books, articles about whitetails, closing in on 400 YouTube videos about all whitetail strategy. And it's not just, you know, the name is Whitetail Habitat Solutions, but it was born out of my love for hunting whitetails and going back to, I think, 1986. So... Whatever time of the week it is during the year, there's always something white tail strategy related. And, um, and especially when you get into the hunting season here, um, looking at the weather, how white tails relate to the weather has been a favorite topic of mine. So it's all over my books, all over my videos. And from creating the books, creating the videos, all of that, that developed into white tail habitat, you know, solutions in the company. And for that, I visit clients around the country. So this year, in the past year, I visit about 90 clients in 14 states. Um, We book out several months in advance. And and basically, I go and I help them design their habitat and hunt. So it's, um, you know, Whitetail Habitat Solutions. And it's interesting, when I go to a lot of landowners' property, they're hiring me to create their habitat for them. But you can't create their habitat and especially on a small parcel, and I mean even 500 to 1,000 acres. I'm not saying that 500 acres is small, but in the deer world it is, meaning that you can't encompass the daily lives of a deer 365 days on 700 acres, for example, especially when it comes to mature bucks. Hmm. So you cannot design a property unless you bring a lot of whitetail hunting into that design and into that hunt. And so the lowest hole in the bucket on any property is how you hunt the land. And it doesn't, no amount of habitat improvement can overcome poor hunting practices. And so uh, hunting when the weather is good and, um, and when you should be in the woods and when you shouldn't based on the weather and when deer are feeding, then to me that is a way to not only manage your hunt but your entire property. It um, doesn't even matter if you're hunting on public land. You know, really getting the most out of your sits and for your efforts and time put in it doesn't matter if it's habitat scouting whatever it is this is a way to manage to me um, not only your hunt but also even your career your family making sure that you're not over hunting yourself because I have done that in 2006 I sat 110 times oh uh, four states over four months um, and I think that was maybe 12 all day sits so I think I passed up 50 bucks during that time you know in those in that uh, that season and I felt you know, almost relieved the season was over at the end. And I never wanted to feel like that again. <laughs> yeah. And so, so hunting by the weather is a way to not only maximize your time in the woods, but to be efficient with a lot of other areas and appropriate with a lot of other areas in your life too. really, really getting your priorities in order. So mm-hmm. it kind of all relates, you know, everything I do, it's, you know, the, the strategy, the habitat strategy, but 
you have to have that hunting strategy and have to know when to say when. And uh, and I, I talked to Mark, when, you know, when we were coming in here that last night was our opening day. You know, 16 days after the actual opener of Wisconsin, it was a decent day, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the future. But uh, Diane, I tried to get her to come up here on this the podcast maybe in the future, but she'd be so nervous, and she was so excited last night because she saw six bucks. And they were within 20 yards at dark. It was past shooting hours. She was actually afraid. They were fighting. Uh, growling, grunting, making a lot of noise, and she couldn't stop talking about it for two hours when we got back. <laughs> I was, I was so excited for her because it reminds me of when I was 16, even and even just the act of putting broadheads on your arrows and and uh, planning for the next day's hunt and watching any VHS tape we could, uh, bow hunting October white tails with Gene and Barry Wunsell back in the day. Oh and, yeah, um, anything we could get our hands on, we were just we were like little kids and and so. I've known Diane for about 12 years, and to see her like that last night is just in last and last year during the season is just awesome. So that's cool. And to me, it all was built back. We had a good day and a, a, our good opener last night because of that. Now, I had a trespasser walk by, so that was a different story. So <laughs> right, yeah, you were dealing with <laughs> that some, was the opposite. Some yeah. ginseng thieves. Yes, and that's what we think. If there's someone in the area we're trying to catch. We have several neighbors that we're trying to trying to catch them, and. Uh, he ended up, uh, Brendan Nading was in the stand with me filming from Black Stamp Media, uh, Breaking Point TV. Mm-hmm. And uh, he let me know there was a guy coming. And and then, I, 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 for better or worse, the woods erupted with my voice <laughs> at that time. <laughs> and he, he exited stage left. He, he was talking about he was lost. That's all he said. I'm lost. I'm lost a couple times. And yeah. I think my voice was so loud I couldn't hear him even saying that. But on the tape, on the video, that that no one that's listening will ever hear, but or, <laughs> or see. But uh, we caught pieces of them in, in on the camera, but not enough. So, so yeah. regardless of the weather conditions, it sounds like uh, possibly the the uh, the noise conditions may have been uh, preventing uh, a good whitetail encounter. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that last twenty minutes last night was bad. Definitely a possibility. <laughs> Man, now, getting back to Diane's set, though, I mean that is so that's so. I mean, seeing things like that. Are um, I don't care if you've seen it ten thousand times in the woods. Like you've seen white oh, tails yeah. probably do that, you know, right a million times. And it right? always gets your heart going. It always gets your heart going. But for a person to have like a first up close encounter and hearing those types of noises for the first time, yeah, I bet, I'm yeah. sure she's talked about it for two hours. I'm she's probably thinking about. It. I mean, that, that's something you remember for the rest of your life. I I glanced over while we're driving and she's going through. See, she took a whole bunch of pictures with her phone, and you can hardly see anything in them. <laughs> but um, she was glancing. She has about 30. And yeah. she was just glancing through them while we're driving. You know, Just reliving it. Yeah, looking at it yeah, That's from cool. last night. Yeah. That is really cool. She, she called you, everybody that she could call about it. Uh, she went down. My son was playing video games down his room. She had to go down and tell him. I could see her, hear her voice through the floorboards you know, of the house. <laughs> <laughs> so. And so when you're, when you're saying, one thing that I find really interesting is you're saying that yesterday was your opener. Yes. And so is that because of the weather that yes. you were, so you were waiting for just that right day for your quote opener yes. to begin. Okay. Yep. And so rather than doing the whole thing where you're getting all antsy, that must take a ton of patience where technically the season is open, but you're actually, you're waiting for this. So, and, and you're right. And I started that patient patience in the early nineties. So by now, you know, after you go into a specific stand and you're going in for a certain buck and you're waiting on the weather, and you do that, and and you shoot them, and then, and you sit. You know, last year I shot two. I sat eight times, and Diane actually sat forty-five times last year as a young hunter, a new hunter, and she had opportunities at maybe seven mature bucks, and a couple <laughs> she couldn't find in the scope because she was so nervous with a crossbow or or rifle, which she did uh, miss one. She didn't wound any. Um, she missed one. A uh, neighbor shot. It was a double drop, double drop time buck in the in the mid one fifties for score. Hmm. Wow. A five year old that we had had three years of pictures of, and um, and uh, so she had she she they were walking by. She didn't know how to stop them. Um, just she learned so much. But we were she sat all the way into mid January. You know, we had the extended season last year with her bow, mm-hmm. and she did shoot a deer with uh, her rifle and uh, doe during the doe season, but. So imagine from September all the way to mid-January, she sat 45 times. Well, it's, when you stretch it out, that's actually 10, 12 sits a, a month. That's a lot. So, and it's spread out over a long time, and she's only hunting the weather. So she kind of hunted like I would. And, and so you expect bucks when you sit. And so when you're basing on the weather, 
to me, there's a very high likelihood that you're going to see that buck if you've done your homework and scouted and set up everything correctly. When you're doing your homework, so kind of rewinding it, it almost sounds like you've gotten the buck's patterns or these these deer's patterns down to such a way where you can almost predict when they're going to be in a certain spot at a certain time. Is that kind of what you're saying? And does that all play into the weather? Or Yeah, so I look at like, you know, a mature buck, just just real briefly on that, Um so we used to have several years of trail cameras. Maybe we've seen them from the stands, but a lot of times when we're shooting that buck, it's the first time we're seeing them from the stand. Hmm. Um, the sign that pops up in the area, the trail cams, um, they let you know that he might be there for timing. They, he might be back in the area. But we're usually finding out in December and January and February that he's still alive with trail cameras. Uh, maybe someone finds a shed from a mile away, um, whatever it might be in the neighborhood, but we know he's alive. We watch him during the summer too. And he's usually about a mile away from the property, mile and a half. So we know that he's alive. And then if you know he's alive and you know his patterns from the year before, then to me it's a matter of having that stand locations, those stand locations, not just one, that, that are complementary stand locations that allow you to get in and out of a certain location from maybe one to two different, two to three different directions. Um, you have different winds that you can use uh, those stands for. And then one may be more of a morning stand because it's very close to bedding and you can't get in in the afternoon. And then you'll have some that are in between and then some that are evening stands where um, you're going in, you're going outside of bedding areas and you're waiting for that buck to come out of that bedding area. So I look at like when you have three or four stands that are wrapped around where he comes onto your property and he's already told you two or three years in a row where he's going to be or what time of the year, you have those stands you know what winds are you're supposed to use them for? Then it's just a matter of waiting for that that good weather day, and and we can talk about the foundation of that. But mm-hmm. um, to me, once you assign what day is a good weather day in the forecast, like this Thursday coming up, that's been a good day in the Check weather, yeah. unless a change in the day. But it's been a good weather a good weather day for about seven days now. Oh, and for I'm about t- so you keep an eye on that. You can day see once the, you, you can see, see the good days coming about a week to ten days in advance. Interesting. So right now I'm just well. What what I'll is it that sets, yeah? What is it that <laughs> sets that day up as being a good weather day? Because right now, you know, all I see is I look at my little ten day thing. It says Thursday, sunny, high sixty eight, low fifty five. What else are you looking at on that day that makes it seem like such a good one? Well, I was going to add to that also, like where are you getting this information? Like what what weather app or tool are you using? Yeah, yeah. To, to That's a good. I get that a lot. You know, people. Um, for me, uh, AccuWeather is one that I use a whole lot. Okay. And um, and actually, I'm looking Wednesday. Tomorrow's a good day too. But um, oh, that's okay. shaping up. Today. But <laughs> Jim, um, I think we're getting. The, I think I'm getting that uh, bug that's going around the marketing department. Oh my gosh! Yeah, gonna be out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the um, so I'm using AccuWeather. This is the daily forecast. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you can just see the highs and lows. Yeah. Going through and their little ads and everything. Um. So just the basis of the weather, what I'm looking at, just at the weather, and, and we explain why here in a little bit, but um, I'm looking at uh, 80 today, mm-hmm. Yeah, a severe PM thunderstorm. Now, okay. I don't hunt morning stands in the early season too much. You might on the opening day, but I save a lot of my best morning stands. Like last year, I had a morning stand that I wanted to hunt. It was a new one. I hunted it twice, shot two bucks. One one time during the primary rut, one time during the secondary rut. Same for stand. Those, same stand. So went in on those, expected to shoot a buck, shot a buck, and it, it really can. I'm not saying it's that easy all the time, but I call them 40% sets, where you go in and you have a 40% chance you're going to shoot a buck. And huh. because those are the only – I didn't hunt that stand until uh, I think it was November 3rd or 4th last year. So waited all that time. Right now, great evening time. And so you're hunting feeding patterns. So when you have today, when that- you have a severe PM thunderstorm, deer feed five times. This is the foundation of the movement. Deer feed five times in a 24-hour period. That's twice in their bedding areas during the daylight. That might be mid to late morning and early afternoon. And then their dinner time, most important feeding is number three of the day, and that's an hour before dark every single day. Every deer is going to be on their feet eating something. That's usually when they go to the ag fields, food plots, They've already been feeding on acorns all day. A lot of people say, well, when the acorns are dropping, then they're not going to be as active. But I look at the opposite. If they have green food sources they want to go to because of that diversity and and acorns are hard to digest, they can't wait to hit that alfalfa, um, late planted soybeans, or green food plots. So it's like washing it all down. They have to have a diversity. It's like... 
you know, if we eat corn all the time, we can't digest corn very well. Right. Oh, and, uh, yeah, and I don't no, think, I can, and even corn, like I you can confirm. <laughs> yeah. Not, and I love it. Not good. You know, thank, thankfully it's only three months out of the year, two <laughs> months out of the year. Cause I eat a lot of it. But, um, the, uh, when it gets into February, March, if deer in their deer yards and you're trying to save them and you go out there and throw a bunch of corn down, you're going to kill them. It develops a toxicity in their, inside their system um, it, it sits there, it rots, it attacks our skeletal system. They exit the deer yards in April, they die in May. And so that corn is, they can't digest it at that point because they're not physically capable of, because they're weak. Wow. So when you look at those five feeding periods, that third time is the most important. And then they feed twice at night. That's our lazy times around here. That's out in the middle of ag fields, fence rows. You find those fence row bedding. You find a big bed in a fence row and you think, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, maybe I should hunt here. Well, that's middle of the night because they're out feeding on the adjacent ag fields. Hmm. So when you see today severe PM thunderstorm, that's, that means there's probably not going to be great feeding out, especially if it's thunderstorm. You'd want it to hit about an hour before dark because then you know that it's keeping those deer away from their best feeding of the day. If they have high winds and they're thunder and lightning, they're probably not even exiting their bedding areas, which means they're, they're missing feeding number three probably feeding number four, feeding number five. Oh, they're hungry. And then it gets back to in the their feedings one and two tomorrow are back in their bedding areas. So they're not getting a lot of food. They're getting browse. You want daytime browse back there. Uh, woody shoots, uh, hardwood regeneration, uh, briars, shrub tips, um, all gray acorns. I consider that almost the same. Where apples are more their high quality th- number three feeding. You wouldn't want to put a bunch of apple trees back in the middle of the woods because now these deer are getting fat and lazy on great food during the day. They don't really need to move to great food and for that number three. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So by the time it gets tomorrow night, they missed a quality feeding. They missed their nighttime quality feedings and they're hungry. And so that sets up tomorrow, especially the harder that thunderstorm is and the longer it is. That sets up uh, Wednesday, Wednesday evening. evening. Now, Wednesday evening, they were talk about, talking earlier in the week with a little rain. But you look at that nine-degree temperature drop, mm-hmm. that's sufficient. I mean, that's really... And then look at the morning difference between... So, on Tuesday, the low is 59. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's Wednesday morning's temperature. Does that make sense? Right. So, 40... Is that 46? Oh, that I is Thursday morning's low. Oh, so look I, yeah. at the difference in, there's a 13 deg- degree drop from morning to morning. So when it's Thursday morning and it's 46 degrees and it's 13 degrees cooler than the night before, if I was going to sneak back and hunt the backside of a bedding area, wait for the deer, deer to come back to me in ag land, that might be a morning I, I do that on because it's 13 degrees less. And what is, the, what, like, the cooler weather, what does that tend to do for deer? They it's kind of like we see on, a, I did a, a trail cam video recently where we just looked back over a lot of our favorite trail cam videos, and it's 90% or, under, or 50 degrees or less. Hmm. And so it's not always about just a certain temperature, but, yeah, it's, it's um, they, uh, they move a lot more when the temperatures are cooler. And it's all relative. You know, if, I'm, if you're talking to someone in Florida, and they're averaging daily highs of 88 and 92 in October, and all of a sudden that's a, a high of 72. It's a significant drop, and the deer are going to react to that. And along with that drop, the harder the drop, does it make sense? Usually there's a lot that, you know, they're talking severe thunderstorms. That's in the forecast. Mm-hmm. So there's always the bigger the drop, the higher the winds, the more extreme the weather. And when all that clears out and that temperature's drop, then they're going to move. Also, during the morning, let's say it's a uh, morning low of 29, and it's going to warm up to 57, then typically it's not out of 30s until 11 or 12. So mm-hmm. you have several hours where it's still comfortable cruising conditions. And they've even had studies where buck, mature bucks will move three times more in the morning hours than the evening. What I find, like right now when you're hunting feeding movements, it's not that a mature buck is moving more miles or more yards during the day. It's just that he's hungry. Something happened to make that temperature go down. It's cooler. And he's just shifting his movements a half hour, hour. And that's all it takes sometimes to get him during the daylight. Mm-hmm. Um, even Diane last night, she saw that bachelor group of, groups of bucks, you know, right in front of her. We haven't seen that bachelor group of bucks out during the daylight like that. And so last night they were close. You know, they're right in front of her stand. I would say... I don't know what legal shooting hours are around here right now. Let's say it's 7.15. 
or 720. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were by her like 725, 730. So they were just right. and she, enough to where she could watch them, see how big they are, yeah. see them fighting. But it was just after shooting hours. So what, you know, so we were looking at, uh, at the weather there, and we're I think we're looking at between maybe it was yesterday and and or today and tomorrow. So anyway, it's like a nine degree drop. Excuse me, nine degree drop, and you're like that's significant. Like at what point does that drop in temp become significant? Is it is it two degrees? Is it five? Is it ten? I look at uh, especially when it starts getting into five to eight, especially if it's accompanied by weather change. So let's say you had severe winds mm-hmm. that just calmed down. And it doesn't mean that that's all relative too. So if you have 50 mile an hour winds and then several hours later, they're 30, that's significant. That's a mm-hmm. big drop. It, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't mean that there has to be no wind. And in, in fact, a lot of times five to eight mile an hour winds is a good thing. You know, a little wind is not a bad thing. There's sure. more, to me, there's more of a direct scent line um, wind that's more uh, reliable. So as a hunter, it's more reliable for where you sit. And as a deer, it's more reliable for where they scent. And so a mm-hmm. little wind's not a bad thing. But um, thunder, lightning, extreme ra- rain, snow, hail, whatever it might be, um, when all that changes, even if the temperatures stay the same, then there's a value for each one of those too. Right. And then uh, actually that dovetails right into what I was going to, try and bring up next is you're talking about a value and so we're talking about a lot of different you know environmental factors variables here uh you know weather elements and you've essentially developed an algorithm everything's algorithms these days jim you know social media this that the other and apparent and apparently the weather for whitetails so jeff if you can maybe touch on a little bit we've talked about a few of the elements here but touch on this this algorithm you've developed to essentially assign you know, a, a value or a number to, you know, days where you may want to hunt or may want to, you know, lay off and, and uh, do some things around the house and uh, possibly keep the peace and then go get your big buck the next time. Yeah. And we are now diving into All Weather Whitetails, his book. Just check it out. We have we have one here, but this uh, is where the algorithm comes from. Look at this, Jeff. I was afraid this was going to look like math. <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's so. We'll just breeze through this because I think it's it's easier. But the concepts are the same. I weighed it. Uh, temperature is extremely important because typically, if there's at least a ten degree drop, twelve degree, fifteen degree drop, something major happened to make that happen. Either it was high winds that came through, and um, And there's a shift in the overall jet stream where it's, you know, major weather plays across the entire country. And and it's just signifying that. And, um, but a lot of times it's accompanied by severe weather. And I think it was 2016, I went down to Ohio. And so our our opening day, you know, was on Saturday in Wisconsin. And Sunday I sat with my steps on Dante in the morning and the winds had cleared out a little bit. We had a nice cold morning. Let's say it was 15 degrees in the morning, 12, and he shot his first buck was awesome. Nice. Took care of the buck. And about two in the afternoon, I had to do Ohio on a 700 mile drive. And I got there, was sleeping on the road, I think once, but I, I ended up getting there to my spot in public land, slept for about 20 minutes and then went out and shot my buck, our target buck that we have lots of video of, uh, about eight 30 in the morning. And I'd only gone down to hunt. It was right before Thanksgiving. So I went down to hunt, um, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, I want to place a priority on mornings during the rut, and um, and then Monday night. And so, and then I was going to get back for Thanksgiving. So I ended up shooting that buck. And it was a long ways to go, you know, money-wise, time-wise, gas-wise, just getting down there, lack of sleep. But it was worth it because there had been a 40-degree temperature drop at that time. And that was around the 20th of November in I think it was 2016. If anybody looks that up, 40 degrees. Holy smokes! So, Huge, and we had up to f- over 50 mile an hour winds that time too. So as you were, so as you were driving to Ohio, right? Was that was that 40 degree drop? Had that already happened, or was that going to happen? It had it already happened? It had already. So happened. I was kind of, I was kind of going with that drop. So say for example, on if if folks remember that opening day was we had really high winds and a lot of cold here in Wisconsin. Okay. And so Sunday... Oh, yeah, it was it pretty was, brutal out. Yeah, I it was... Brutal's a good word. I sat with my son, Jake, and 
we sat in a pretty decent spot and I think we saw one deer mm-hmm. and it was just, the wind didn't stop. It looked like it was supposed to calm down on Saturday. Friday I went out and I was trying to put a pop-up out mm-hmm. in, in a, off to the side area. The thing blew way down in the bedding area. Must oh wait, was this, two, yards. was this two years ago? Um, Not last fall, but the fall before uh, two, o- opening two, of Rifle. It was 2016. No, 2017 was a really good, um, that was a really good day too. Okay. But no, uh, 2016. Okay. Yeah, it was 2016. So um, so that happened in Wisconsin here. And so when I was traveling on Sunday, it started to calm down Sunday morning. So when I, they're about a day behind, day and a half. So when I was traveling over there, I was basically traveling with that weather. So it was still kind of windy. I think the forecast that morning was for, let's say, uh, 12 to 18 mile an hour winds, you know, settling throughout the day. But there'd been that huge temperature drop, you know, a heavy rain, then freezing temperatures. I think it was in the twenties when I went out. I remember I was really cold when I shot that buck and mm-hmm. I was in an area where I was exposed, but, um, you know, a lot of times you are because you're looking at that wind in your face or wherever, because you're watching in front of you and you want to keep that wind where it is bow hunting. Um, so you're really placing a high priority first on the temperature change. Mm-hmm. Uh, wind speed change is a really big factor. And then depending on the amount of stress, Within that, so imagine imagine if you look at it from a buck. So you're placing that on uh, temperature, wind change, the amount of days before that it was calm and, and just boring. That To me, it's kind of like if it drops 20 degrees and then sits a day and then drops another 20 degrees, it's, it's all drop. You know, it doesn't mean that it's not creating some great times to hunt. Mm-hmm. But there's not that long, boring consistency where deer get kind of lulled into this average day and all of a sudden bam it just hits them really hard i think so you get a factor for that leading up to it too so you're i'm putting a priority on those and then it you're expressing a value of 70 and then when i look back and do the math most of the bucks i've harvested back to the early night has been eight nine ten so I mean, seven there's very few days in between so like out of a 45 day forecast you might have 10 really good days mm-hmm. and you have a few days in between and then you have 25, 30 that are just bad. Mm-hmm. And talk about the priority of that in a second, but I'm looking at it like, so deer feed five times going back to that in 24-hour period. And so let's say a major front goes through, the temperature's drop at 30 degrees, or major severe weather, major winds. They're sitting back in their bedding area, and they're not leaving. So they're missing a lot of quality feedings. Mm-hmm. So that's one way they're burning energy, energy the stress. Yeah. Then the temperature's dropping. So if it is a major temperature drop, you know, let's see, even if it goes from 80 to 58, cooler temperatures, they're burning energy Mm -hmm. just to stay warm. So that's another way. And then the fact that they're missing those feedings. So three ways, the stress, the temperature drop, and the fact they're missing feedings, they're really hungry hungry and burned out just by sitting doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And so when that clears, it's time for them to be on the move, whether it's feeding during the rut, it's like throwing gasoline on on top of a gas fire. You know, they're 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 ready to move and right. they're ready to feed, they're ready to rut, they're ready to cruise, and so it all those urges that they have are just greatly multiplied after that goes through. But then by the second day, it's kind of like if we were lost in the wilderness, and you know, you guys talk to a lot of survivalists and people that are out hunting in the out west, and and I'm sure a few of those have been lost or whatever they had to spend the night out in the woods. We get back and we're super hungry. And wherever our favorite place is to go eat, we go eat. And, mm-hmm. and we fill up. But do we do that the next day? We just filled up Monday. You don't go back and eat the same amount on Tuesday. You yeah, know, we right. were lost for three days. Pretty much good at that We replenish point. that. So there's a little factor maybe that second day. You're still appreciating the good food in front of you that you didn't have for a few days when you thought you were going to starve. Mm-hmm. But by the third day, you're it's basically the same and so i look at it like there's a huge value that first day maybe a little the second but by the third day it's just the same even if the conditions are the same everything is kind of reached a new equilibrium at right. that point so it sounds it sounds to me like maybe if you looked at it you know that initial shock or snap of something changing dramatically you don't necessarily want to maybe go out and correct me if i'm wrong here but you don't necessarily maybe want to go out like right as that's happening but maybe maybe just shortly after or right. something. So now there's there's a couple different ways to look at that. We're blessed around here with hills. And mm-hmm. so let's say we've had the extreme rain mm-hmm. 
so and, and we've had the extreme snow, whatever it might be, it's calming down over the next 12 hours, 16 hours, whatever it might be. You can see that. That's one of the things that you look at AccuWeather. I use their hourly forecast. And, and that's pretty reliable as far as winds go, wind direction, wind speed, because those are major jet stream influences across the entire country. They're major influences. How much rain we get, if we get rain, if it's snow, if it's rain, all those things are up in the air. Those are the things that the weather people are always chasing. Mm-hmm. But the big winds, the wind direction, that's pretty, pretty consistent. So if you're going out on the back side of that, and let's say you're on the lee side of it, so heavy northwest winds because it's a cold front, they're coming through. So you're on a south-facing slope, and you're 100 feet in elevation down on the bluff. Yeah. You're going to hardly have a leaf stirring. Yeah. And so that's where all those deer are. And you, the whole time you can sit and look across the hollow at a 250-yard shot, and the, the trees over there just rocking back and forth. A lot of noise. Well, those deer are stressed there they know that they can just go down and across the hollow and get on the lee side. And so you add that deer in the rut and you add big winds like that. And to me, you put a large percentage of the deer on the lee side of the ridge. And we've shot a lot of deer like that too. So um, not to mention, again, if it goes back to the winds topped out at 42 miles an hour and right now they're 26, still a major wind speed. And especially when, if it's going to be decreasing every hour, might be still really windy, but not a bad time to uh, go out and hit the stand too. Huh. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. that's another great way to look at this weather too. I mean, in some in some ways it's pretty simple. It's like, where would I be? You know, wh- to where, cover. where where yeah. is it, where yeah. is it, where is it comfortable right now? Because it's not comfortable over there. That's no. miserable. But no. over, over here, it feels pretty on good. Northwest northwest facing slope during you know forty mile an hour winds, they're going to leave, and I've seen that. They bail out of that hollow where the out of west winds coming into that hollow, and they'll go up and over a saddle in a field to get down in the calm side. Some of my best nights. Where that just that hollow's clear. Well, it, I know it, it does I, make sense. You just gotta. It's something that, when you actually put time into thinking about it, it makes sense. But I I feel like a lot of times people go out, or at least I know this has been the way for me. I go out, and as soon as I'm out there, it, it's kind of like they say uh, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face, as like Mike Tyson or somebody like that. Uh, you kind of have a plan and then you get out there and you're all excited and your adrenaline's pumping and you're trying to get to your spot or whatever. And then, you know, everything's happening all at once and all you want to do is just see a deer. And at that point you've kind of thrown all your strategy to the wind just cause you got a little bit too anxious or something yes. like that. Well, well that, or, you know, you maybe you've hunted the air before and maybe, you, maybe you have a pre hung stand and it's, and it's a good stand and you've mm-hmm. seen deer there before. Heck you've shot deer out of it before. Maybe it's the same time of year, but that day, maybe the deer, just don't want to be there. Yes. And that's, uh, so this is more of a methodical approach. Yeah. Where you're looking at it, I'm not hunting unless the weather's good. And you can say like the Saturday before opening day, if folks look this up for Wisconsin this year, the opening day was the 14th. So on 13th on Friday, it was an exceptional day to hunt, but it was a day too early, of course. Uh-huh. Saturday wasn't that bad. It was the second day. And a lot of bucks fell on the Saturday evening. There's quite a few on social media that, but by Sunday, people weren't shooting a lot of bucks and it was really warm. I think it warmed up to over 80. Um, so you really, you know, you can look at this. I like going backwards and seeing, you know, when those days yeah. were good, mm-hmm. but when it comes down to your favorite stand, you know, this method- methodical approach for the weather. And we can talk about how I believe that helps you with family, friends, career, mm-hmm. you know, as far as managing those priorities. And a lot of people, there's something I want to get to in, in, in this talk, but a lot of people say, well, you know, you can hunt any day you want. And I basically can, you know, I'm going to see my dad this week and my family. That's a different thing, but you know, certain priorities pop up, but, um, I can hunt most of the time, but you can still use this if you're a 40 hour week, you know, working person, like a lot of people. And, um, and, and you can take that methodical approach. We can talk about how you can cheat to the best day and that kind of thing. But, um, when it comes to tree stands, a lot of people get locked into that. And, I look at it like your favorite tree stand should be the next tree stand you shoot a big buck out of, not the last. You should have no favorites. And so for that, every stand you put out has a purpose. And so if you hit it for the right purpose for the right time of the year, you have that mapped out in your head ahead of time, and you match that to a particular buck movement you're after. And then you match that plan and that strategy for that particular stand um, to a good weather day, and you just hunted another stand four days earlier on another front or a week earlier, and you skip around you could have eight to 10 stands in a 40 acre parcel and you might hunt one of them two, three times. You might hunt a couple of them, not at all. And then the rest you hunt 
one, two times at the most. And so hmm. you really can spread out a lot of sits and be very efficient because every stand has its place. And if you base it on the weather, then you narrow it down. And, and then it's a very efficient, methodical approach. You just keep chipping away at a buck movement and, until you get them. The weather can even determine... Well, I guess going back a little bit to what you were saying, how sometimes depending on where a wind is coming out of or something like that, I could see how the weather could determine which stand you're going to. Definitely. Not necessarily just what day you're going out, but also just where you're choosing to hunt. Yeah, because you could have a northwest wind, that a stand that's exposed, mm -hmm. and then one that's hidden behind, you know, on the lee side of the ridge, and uh, and that'll determine uh, yeah. where you're sat to. That makes sense. Now, one one thing that I think is probably something I could see a few listeners thinking right now, I, I'm even thinking it a little bit myself, for example. So Eric, Mark, and I have a hunting trip coming up actually this weekend here. And uh, this is a trip we've been planning for quite a while. We're going to go up north. And, uh, you know, so that's something where we've taken time out of our schedules. We know we're going on that day. We know where we're going. So it's kind of like it's going to happen. You know what I mean? And... So whatever the weather is going to be on those days that we're up there, it's just going to be that way. Right. You know? So let's say we go up and it doesn't end up being super great weather conditions. What do you say to somebody who is in that kind of situation? Are they sort of SOL or are there other things that they can do to almost utilize a not so great day or, or to, to at least extract the maximum potential out of a not so great day? There's, there's a couple things. Now, do you have a flexible boss? Uh, I don't know. You're real stingy around here. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I ask that is a lot of times, especially if you're looking at it ahead of time, you know, do you take a long weekend and you leave Thursday night or do you leave and then come back Sunday night or do you take a long weekend and leave Friday night and come back Monday? And mm -hmm. so even just cheating it one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. talking about your, you know, with your manager, with your boss, whoever, um, you know, in advance and saying, hey, I'm going to look at the weather. A lot of people have that flexibility in their career. Now it comes back to family too and family timing. So that might, um, but then the second thing, there's using assemblage of stands or potential stand locations. It's usually not that there's three guys or three hunters and they're going out and they're hunting these three stands and that's it. Um, there's also sometimes some public land or, you know, it depends on the size of the property around. But when I look at that opportunity, then I'm looking at like, you know, if I know, if I'm feeling a lot better about the stand for whatever reason and the weather's changing within those three days and I'm hunting on a long weekend, then I'm going to definitely slant that stand towards the best day and not sitting the first day unless that's the best day. So a lot of people can't wait to go sit in a certain stand locations back, going back to what you said, Mark. And so instead of saying, well, I can't wait to get to that stand, so I'm going to hit it the first time out, um, really slant that towards the best weather day. Right. Oh, the best okay, weather yeah. morning, what, the best weather time. So Stack your chances as much as you possibly can. Don't right. necessarily just go to the best stand on the worst day. So we would go to the best stand some, on the best day. And somehow exercise patience. Yes. Yeah, <sighs> patience We're is have key. Eric with us. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of like, so this is back in 2003, 2004, when we couldn't just pull this up on our, you know, our phone really quickly. So we would call home. And, and we wanted the last minute possible. So we would call home on our little flip cell phone and, and ask them to look up the weather. And it was weather.com we would use, look at the hourly forecast. And we would literally write down like every three hours for the weekend what the forecast was, wind direction, wind speed, you know, of course, temperature and everything. We could figure that out. Um, but then we would talk about on the way down to hunt for that three-day weekend, which stands we were sitting on Monday and Saturday morning, Saturday night. We'd plan it all out so that we were cheating our best hmm. sits. And we satisfied that, that patience, because we could still go out and sit. Mm -hmm. You know, we still went out and sat somewhere, but this is a stand off to the side. And, you know, we didn't feel as strong about it. Um, but that's how we, we cheated that. And that goes with weeks. Uh, you know, my... Uh, hunting buddy Carl, he lives in Georgia now, but he would travel up his 21, 22 hour drive and um, he would take nine days off. And that's just what he had. It was the last few days of October and then the first full week in November. And so he'd come up on a uh, Thursday or Friday night and then he'd hunt through the following Sunday. And he would look at, and there we figured he'd have three or four really good days. And I talk about this in the book. I used to talk about Carl too, but um, three or four good days that couldn't be missed, maybe four or five. 
there were a couple days where he just went and played pool in the bar and had a few beers and had fun. Um, nice. He went and bought a fishing pole a couple times, and then out of state fishing license went and fished trout in the in the streams because it was an eighty five degree day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and then he had a couple days, so he managed his sits that way. And and when he did that, he was a lot more successful. I had the ability where I just go home, and so there was one time we came out and I. I was prepared to stay. I've, I've never hunted. I usually hunt three or four days at the most and hunted a few days in the, in the first weekend. It was going to get really hot. We're sitting out getting us catching a sunburn in a cow pasture on, on Monday. And I'm like, I'm going to go home. I was a real estate appraiser. And, uh, this was back in, you know, 2005 came back on Thursday morning on a fresh morning stand that we'd never hunted before and shot 174 inch that we were after. And it was, that's awesome. You know, if we would have, sat there Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Thursday, you know, Wednesday, those le- days leading up to that, that Thursday morning was the, the, the drop and the front came through on Wednesday. And if we would have sat in on one of those poor sets, I don't think we realized that value of that high value day because we destroyed the area, leaving our scent behind and spooking mm-hmm. deer on bad days um, leading up to that. And so that's part of it. You're trying to maximize and hold the value of that day. And if you, if you're out there over pressure in that stand, you're not going to realize that value. Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple of really important things to point out there. You know, number one, like uh, hunting, hunting 10 days in a row, like it's bad. <laughs> well, it's, it's hard, you know, so not, and that is it's taxing. Uh, it's that taxing. Is very taxing. So, yeah. you know, kind of by, by implementing, you know, some of these techniques, you're not only burning that stand out on days that are are maybe less likely to to you know ultimately end and you know harvesting that buck you're burning yourself out so oh, yeah so you're making when you're picking those high value sits you're making them a higher value sit by not being burnt out yourself not being tired actually wanting to be in the stand being right. excited about being in the stand uh attentive paying attention not saying, uh, yeah, I'm in a ladder stand, I'm buckled in. Maybe I, you know, I'm not going to suggest anybody ever sleep in a tree stand. Never well, done it myself. I'm, Jimmy, I'm if you like, yeah, I, I sleep on, yeah, I sleep in the tree stand all the time. But uh, Jimmy, if you look Somebody up, uh, um, shooting more bucks from the couch. I don't know if I wrote that article in 2014 or 15, but I believe, you know, people, I, I can't stand that saying. You can't shoot more bucks by sitting on a couch. I believe you can. <laughs> and, uh, and and it's because you're exercising five, patience. Five ways to shoot more bucks from the couch. That's a good title. It is yeah. a good title. <laughs> yeah, so. But it, the, I'd the, click the, on it. The point is it's patience. Yeah, it's been hit on a lot, but it's um, it's exercising that patience. And it's yep. not just burning out your stand and your land. Your family. Yep. And your, your boss, your career. So, it's always nice when you can get back to the office for a few days or get back to work. And it's not when you take, I know for me, I, I, hardly, I can't take, you know, on YouTube, I answer at least an average of an hour comments a day mm-hmm. and that's wow. 365. Oof. So if I don't answer them for a day, then I look at it like the next day. I've had times where I've sat for three hours answering comments on YouTube and I try to answer at least 80, 90%. But so I, I never take a break, you know, full, full, just days off a break but i like doing that too so it's it's a little bit different um it's different when you're working for yourself too i'm but, on uh, accuweather right now actually that's why i'm on my phone because i'm looking up the uh general area where we'll be okay hunting. i just wanted to see i was curious if we might see some temp drops so the the cool thing about all that is what i really like about the weather is when you're talking major weather influences or influences which is what we're looking at anyways you can usually pick those out seven to 10 days in advance. So if you look at next week mm-hmm. on AccuWeather, it's getting down like Sunday, this coming Sunday, you know, or Tuesday right now, it's supposed to be 79. And then Monday, 77, Tuesday, 77, and then Wednesday, 64, Thursday, 60, Friday, 61. And I'll be doing that, um, the, the hunting public public land challenge in Michigan those days. Oh, and awesome. So nice. We're actually hitting, because I can, the day, it's just a day behind over there. So... I'm looking at the opener over there is probably going to be 75, 80, and maybe even the second day. But by the third day, we're mid 60s, and by the uh, fourth of October, I'm sure if you look up, you know, Lansing, Michigan, or Alpena, or the UP in Michigan, anywhere in Michigan, it's about a day behind. You're going to see that because it's coming from the west. It's yeah, got to so make its, its way day. over there. Yep. Hmm. Jeff's going to sit on the couch for two days and then just go in and clean up. Exactly. That's yeah, what it I'll, sounds I'll just like. be sitting back at camp. That's <laughs> I, told, I told those guys, I'm looking forward to just sitting around camp and, you know, having yeah. some fun and talking, you know, during that challenge. So 
No, I got to admit, the days that we're going to be up there, Mark, all I'm seeing is 60, 61, 61, 68. So Which sounds comfortable, but it sounds kind of like one of those. Those are good. Stable. Kind of. It's, what, so it what's it before like the 61? So before the 61, or uh, sorry, before the... The first day. The anyways. first day is 60, and before that you have Thursday is 64, and then Wednesday is 65, and Tuesday is 76. So, so they do have that huge drop, drop slanting down into those. So I would hunt your best stands the first day. And if and that's a case where first day, if, you could, if we, you could cheat and move it up one day, yeah. If that was possible, it's different when there's three people going. And but if you're just going by yourself or meeting somebody, then um, if you could move that a day ahead of time, I do that because um, you know you're going to realize higher to me higher value. We'll check with the boss. We'll see if we can do it. But if we do go as planned, then you know try to hunt our best stand the first day. At least you know that. At will least be what able we to... think it is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Then, yeah. It's and always then, a moving target. And, right. Yeah. Then we won't have to worry about trying to calm Eric down. Right. And, yeah. and keep him low key and you know, <laughs> jumping out in the woods. Yeah, yeah. He turns into a whole other person when he's out there. Um, but that is on on uh, Sunday though. I do see it says a strong afternoon tea storm. So that's that's the mm. that's so the good, second to good last chance day. for washout. The second to last. So, day. but so that strong afternoon tea storm though, right? So, can we use that to our advantage sure. and and be like okay? You know, and actually, I wanted to ask you about this, like, you know, as far yeah, as deer, good. you know, sensing, feeling weather, uh, maybe the differences between weather and barometric pressure, even though I know barometric pressure is part of weather, but I feel like there's a difference there. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I'd like to talk about barometric pressure, too, when we get, okay. to that, get to that. It's a good... Awesome. So, but like, so is that that afternoon tea storm? I mean, is there, are those deer going to be able to sense that and go, we're going to feed heavier and longer that morning because we feel like this is coming? Sometimes. And so have you ever noticed how there there is an opportunity sometimes where they feed before an approaching storm? Right. right. Um, but have you ever noticed how they never get trapped out in open areas? Mm-hmm. So they don't get trapped out. You don't drive by in a blizzard and there's a whole bunch of deer just feeding out in the corn. Mm-hmm. You know, it's... Oh, yeah. They seek shelter. So they, they seem to know how, you know, and I think by the wind the change in wind by the moisture in the air, they can tell when something's really coming in and who knows how far they can hear thunder and lightning coming away and, you know, who are yeah. coming from, but who Stuff knows? Stuff we that. humans could probably notice if we weren't, you know, yeah, if we slow eyes down. deep and brain deep in our computers and cell phones right. all the time. And that's... I'm looking at my phone for the weather, Jim. I'm not looking around me for the weather. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, that's why we put weather in the phone so <laughs> that way you could figure out what was going on. That's could, another chapter in one of the books is... You know, hunting on the front side of those fronts that come through. Okay. The holes in the weather, in between. Sometimes there's yes. a calm. Um, that's so. Let's say you have major, major rain. Even let's say it was going to rain all day Sunday, but you notice from two to five, it's getting dark at seven. But from two to five, there's absolutely zero rain. You can see in the radar that there's not going to be any rain. There's just nothing. It's forecasted. There's a big hole. Great time to go out and sit. I usually go out in the rain let things calm down, and then I enjoy that three hours. And then once it starts thunder and lightning, I'm getting back out of the stand. Right. But there might be some opportunity, what I noticed. So a lot of times, let's say on the back side of that front, it's going to be cooler. Mm-hmm. Um, but even on the front side, let's say it's going to be 62, and it's 82 right now. And then that front's coming through, it's going to hit at midnight mm-hmm. or 10 o'clock. On that front side, it's cloudy. Mm-hmm. and the temperature might be down 6, 8 degrees from what it was before and give you an opportunity there. And if you do the math, that'll be a 6 out of 10. That's mm-hmm. one of those in-between times. Um, after it passes, it's high. But then at the same time, with that, then I'm looking at on Monday morning, so let's say that goes through on Sunday, I'm going to look for, I'm not going to go right on a big major food source because they're going to be back in their bedding areas, but they're going to be hungry. So I'm looking at where can I have a bedding area stand where I can get into, but not walking through the food source, coming in through a back door, waiting for those deer to come back to me. If that bedding area is 100 yards away from a food source, then that might not be far enough because they're just going to go in from the food. They're already there in the bedding. It's, it's a short transition. But hmm. let's say they're going through open hardwoods where there's not really good bedding, and then it takes 400, 500 yards for them to get to a swamp. Maybe there's some acorns, oaks in that area. 
So you can slip in off to the side, kind of at the swamp, between the oaks, the swamp, and then that'd be a great morning transition stand where thunderstorm the night before, they're hungry because they miss quality feedings. It's settling down that morning. The front's already gone through, and you're taking advantage of those morning stands. And in that case, when I'm driving a long ways to hunt and you're only there for those three weekends or three days, then I'm going to take a chance on those bedding area stands that I wouldn't otherwise if I had the choice of just ultimate management. Hmm, interesting. So, I mean, I think that, like, looking at that, so we're going to be hunting, you know, via a river corridor. Actually, the river is going to be our, our method of travel, if you will. So, mm-hmm. and we don't have the luxury of ever been in this area before. We've scouted, it, you know, with Onyx and aerial maps and Google Earth and things like that. We got a, a few, I guess what we think, you know, educated guess is hot spots, right? Yeah. But what night were those thunderstorms supposed to hit? Sunday. So that's the second to last day. So Sunday night, or if they hit Sunday night. Sunday afternoon is when it Afternoon, says. then a good time. Monday morning. To hunt would be actually be Monday what? morning where those deer will likely, like if there's a little bit of egg up on top there. They'll likely be feeding there, and we might catch them on the way back. And they'll probably be feeding longer into the morning. I mean, maybe let's say they would get out just as just at the hint of dawn. Maybe they're heading back to their stands or back to their bedding areas. Well, let's say maybe they're uh, waiting an extra half hour, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing because then it allows you to slip into a bedding area, especially if it's not 100 yards away from the food source. You're looking at, okay, this is where I think a bedding area is. Mm-hmm. I like taking um, large marshes where mm-hmm. it's wet. Uh, so big wet marshes, uh, big open hardwoods, trying to block out areas where I don't think that they are going to bed, mm-hmm. and then using those to access or blow my scent into, and using them as blockers to where if the deer are feeding here, they have to transition by or alongside this non-deer, non-bedding area to get back to their bedding areas three, 400 yards away, and then I'm gotcha. slipping into the side and waiting for them to come back in the morning. Hmm. So. I like it. Me- methodical. Wow. Yeah. You're saying, so long, long before, so a lot of my clients, like I look at a 40 acre parcel, we have 11 tree stands. We'll number them one to 11, not all do this, but some of them want me to go through and we'll say, okay, number one is a Northwest, North, Northeast stand, morning stand. And they might ask why, you know, but by that point we've talked about it. This is the, at the end of the day, um, We'll go through stands one through 11. And that way it's a lot more methodical. You're saying this is a morning stand because it's backed by bedding. This is an evening stand because it's near food. This is a cruising stand because it's in between. And you can expect mm-hmm. all day cruising in a spot like that. A lot of people, and it's, it's about assigning value not only by the weather, but by stand location. Mm-hmm. And so that morning stand we're talking about Monday, Monday morning after that storm, maybe that's a 10 out of 10 because you're right winds, right location. It's a bedding area, right timing of the day. Mm-hmm. The closer it gets to dark, that stand is not a 10 out of 10. It turns into a 1 out of 10 or a 2 out of 10 because all the deer are leaving their bedding areas and going to food. Mm-hmm. So to maximize the value, if you looked at it as two sits per day, and in the middle of the rut, you can look at the middle portion of the day, so, so 30. But if you give it a 10 out of 10, a normal day to me, morning and evening opportunity, uh, like the pre-rut, is more morning and evening, not midday. They're not cruising much in the midday. But um, you say you have a full overall value of a 10 in the morning, 10 in the afternoon. Well, if you're sitting in the same stand all day, which a lot of people on social media, you see, you know, they have all their stuff out going in for an all-day sit, and it's September 27th. And to me, probably half their day is wasted. And so you look at, I'm sitting in this morning stand in this bedding area, 10 out of 10. I'm flipping around to this evening food source movement. And so I'm maximizing the value of my entire day, 20, you know, 20 out of 20, mm-hmm. where if you were just sitting in that one stand all day, it might be a 12 out of 20. You missed a lot of value and a lot of opportunity, even if you were hunting on the mm-hmm. right day based on the weather. Wow. I feel in some ways you're, we're almost getting at think more, hunt less. But I don't want to say that because I don't want to seem like we're saying you're all, you're just you're hunting in a different way. You're hunting while you're thinking, you know. So <laughs> being if you very look at, proactive. If you look at all the you're chapter, being very proactive. You're being calculated. So you're being I, very ca- yes, exactly. So it's not necessarily it's not like kill a deer by just sheer volume of going of just being out there. Efficiency. It's, it's efficiency. Yes. yes. So yes, being, using being calculated to be efficient. So yes. Mark, look at yeah. chapter two title. 
Okay, okay. Chapter two, playing poker in the deer woods. Okay. So I go into great detail how I'm a really bad poker player. Like in Pennsylvania, playing dime poker for 17 years, I would estimate they took $50 for me from me. <laughs> <laughs> so I lost a lot because I'm not very good. But what I notice a lot of those good poker players, they're just going out and hunting whenever, hunting wherever, doing the same thing every time in the deer woods. And for, and for that, they don't shoot a lot of deer. But if they took those poker skills and applied it to the deer, you're always just playing the percentages and odds. And to me, it's not like you're adding up one or two, three percent. You're adding up 20, 30. You're adding up chunks by making good decisions. Mm -hmm. So if you play poker in the deer woods, the time of the day for that stand, the time of the season, you know, is this a rut morning stand? Well, you don't want to sit in it, you know, September 28th or October 10th. And then, of course, using the weather. And, and so you're looking at several different ways that you can methodically narrow it down to just greatly tilt the odds in your favor. It's kind of like, you know, you're playing f poker with four people and you know what two of the hands are before the round even begins. And that's kind of, to me, using the weather. It's not a 100% as if you knew all hands, but you at least know you're getting two a out of three. You're getting a head start. Very much so, a big head start. And so, and that's what's hard to exercise that patience because... Until you've done it, it's successful. You've done it again, it's successful. You've done it for a few times. Then it's hard to exercise that patience because you don't realize yet. You know, Diane's, it, she goes hunting when we talk about she should go hunting. You know, she wants to go when she sees deer, so she just relies on me. It's pretty easy because she's not making those decisions herself for the most part. I mean, if she said, I really want to go hunting, I'm not going to. You know, I want her to go out and we'll find a spot for her to sit. <laughs> she wants to go out and sit in a stain, but she wants to see deer. And so we just kind of take that methodical approach. And, um, and I think if more people played poker in the deer woods, they'd be just the success they experience. And that's why I love, that's why I have the comments and the engagement on YouTube and uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook. I like interacting because I love hearing that feedback. You know, people have hunted a certain way for 25 years, decided to try this for the last two years. And mm -hmm. Saw me more deer. They shot their biggest buck. I just, I love all those stories. Yeah. So, well, what everybody's always kidding around about too is, you know, making other people mad because they're always gone. And this would imply that you don't have to just be gone for mm -hmm. sheer volumes of time again, you know. Right. So, and that's everybody's which happier. Probably, right you know, by the numbers, right? Just the odds are. I mean, I, yeah. and I do subscribe to the fact in some ways, right? Like, if that's your time, if that's your time to hunt. And then if you, if you are in the woods, then anything can happen. Yes. You know? And yes. But, um... And that's where... And this is more, and it's hard because, you know, there's always that balance. People want to be in the woods. They'll say, you know, it's kind of like a, a bad day fishing is still a good day. Sure. Yeah, it's still kind of a sanctuary. But, but at the same time, um, you know, hunting, you know, there's so many things. You know, I'm on, on client properties all year, so it's... Um, well, let alone working on the property, but going bird hunting. If you enjoy pheasant hunting, grouse hunting up north. When I lived out in the woods in the UP of Michigan for 14 years, there was always something we were doing outside that if it was a bad day to hunt, it might be a great day. Usually if it's a bad day, where, and Diane and I are already, are already talking, there's a place I like walleye fishing up in Canada. Mm -hmm. And we have a little window in October of getting up there. And if the weather is good to fish, that means it's bad to hunt. So that means it's 80 down here, 75 in October. Then I'm going to head up fish. We're going to go fishing while I fish for, because that's pretty good during October up there. It'll be. Yeah. And, and the first chapter of the book is balancing the whitetail priorities. And, and so chapter mm -hmm. one is, you know, trying to balance, you know, time, family, career, all of that. And yeah, you can say, you know, and people say that all the time, they just, they want to get out in the woods and um, that's the time I have to hunt. But even like taking a week off, are you better taking a week off and just hedging your bets for that, that seven days? Or what about three long weekends in a row where mm -hmm. you talk to your supervisor and say, Hey, can I slant this towards Friday or Monday? Let's say you're, you're 40 hour work week and you have a Saturday and Sunday to hunt. And for whatever reason, Saturday is terrible. Let's say it's 85 and windy and you know, your spouse is chomping at you to spend some time with the family. Well, 
you know, maybe go to a cider mill on Saturday and spend the time with the family knowing that when you go out on Sunday, you have a really high likelihood mm-hmm. you're going to shoot a, shoot a deer, especially on a small property or public land where you haven't burned it out on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one thing that I was thinking. I mean, that exact same thing earlier. You know, I've got a young family, got a four-year-old, five-year-old, uh, you know, little girls. And, you know, on the weekend, oftentimes the weekend, that's those are your days to hunt, Saturday, Sunday. And oftentimes it's one of those days. Yes. And I'd say, in general, I pick Saturday just because Sunday's kind of like that, okay, let's get ready for the work week again and and, uh, things like that. However, though, looking closer at the weather, you may want to pick Sunday and spend, honestly, what what probably or likely is a little bit nicer day with Mm -hmm. the family. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, it kind of, um, I have a hunting partner. I'm still friends with him to this day. We hunted a lot in the past, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, um, many out-of-state hunting trips. And, um, you know, back in the years when it was uh, early 2000s, into the mid-2000s, somewhere around there, end of 2000s, and, um, you know, I had to rely on those weekends a lot of times, so we took a lot of weekend trips. Um, but it got to that point where in following the weather, somewhere in, in those mid 2000s time frame where I'm just, I'm not going hunting unless it's good weather. Yeah. So he'd have a long weekend, banker's hours, you know, set up for that, that weekend that he could go. And I'm seeing a major front on a Wednesday and huge drop on Wednesday morning. So I'm driving down after the family goes to bed on Tuesday night at 10 o'clock. I get down here to Wisconsin when I live seven hours away. I get down here for a half hour nap in the truck. And then I go out and shoot a buck that morning or that evening and I only planned to hunt one day or even just I came down to hunt one morning because I knew it was a great morning I had to get back that evening so I go back to work so it's just one day off work but that value of that one day couldn't be surpassed by you know three weekends worth of bad weather and so let alone comparing it to three days of bad weather um, you know just coming up so that so to me I made a lot of sacrifices for driving 14 hours alone, sleeping in the truck because I couldn't afford a hotel, and then going back. And a lot of people say that they can't, you know, they, they work 40 hours a week. They, they work a set job. They can't take – well, if they didn't take that extra day off on a long weekend during bad weather, maybe they saved it towards that weather. Maybe they have someone that's flexible or you don't have to put that vacation time in nine months in advance – then there's a lot of opportunities sometimes to hunt one really high value day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and if you hunt a nine out of 10, 10 out of 10 sit, there's not only do those one out of 10, two out of 10 days not add up ever to that, but they destroy that, that ultimate 10 out of 10 day sit that's in the forecast mm-hmm. because you burned out your stands, your lands, and sometimes your family and your job before you could actually take advantage oh, of that yeah. high value set. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. There's, Two things that I was wondering here as we discussed this. So the first one, they might they might go together. The first one is these weather changes happen pretty much all the time, right? And All and the time. The reason I ask that is because I could see where, for example, you're saying that your opening day was yesterday, right? And that was uh, a considerable amount of time after the actual technical opening day on the calendar. Right. And so some people may think, well, well, if I try to do this, I may never go hunting because I may never get that right day. But it it always is capable of happening because there's always fronts moving through and winds and the world is... The weather patterns are Yeah, crazy and there would thing. have been, probably been one, to be honest, there would have been one or two days in there, and I was finishing my book in Canada, so that helped push us off a little bit. I probably would have hunted in the first 10 days. Okay. Um, once. Yeah. So I think I missed one opportunity. Um, Saturday evening of the opener, maybe we would have gone out too. Um, but looking back over the bucks I'm after, we have one called the Whiteout, one is a Split Brow Buck, and one is G2, and another one's Jackson. And on Diane's property, we call it Diane's property, but um, another one called Tower. Most of those bucks are not, they're moving around daylight, you know, once a week here and there, um, but we're not getting consistency. But I know like the Split Brow Buck in particular, he's a six-year-old, he starts coming in like last year, we had a lot of video footage of him from September 26th and then on. So, hmm. You know, right now is still a little early. Mm. So that's another part of it too. You know, we don't have the major influences. So, but during the season, 
there's usually some type of front that's coming through every five to seven days. Okay. And, um, and for that, every time a front comes through, you get east winds on the front side. So a lot of people say we don't get east winds, but I'm looking at Saturday right now coming up in Wisconsin, and I think it's Saturday is east winds for an evening set, and Sunday is south-southeast. And so we're already planning on Saturday, Sunday, Diane saying, I want to go out tomorrow. You know, I want to go out. She's excited. And I'm like, oh, hold off. We're going to see mom and dad. We'll be back on Saturday. Saturday, Sunday looks really good for this weekend in Wisconsin. And and you're seeing that up where you guys are going to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're exercising patience, but yeah, every, and then when it gets to the rut, you have to figure in the rut value a little bit too. Mm -hmm. And, and then I'm looking at too, there's a lot of times because of winds and moisture jet stream that you look at um, so the daytime highs are 57 57 58 54 57 you know right in a row but there's a morning to morning in there that instead of being uh 42 41 37 all of a sudden 32 and then back up to 42 so for whatever reason the winds are coming down there's less there's fewer clouds in there and there's less wind so it allows that temperature to drop, and at that 32 degree morning, even though every mo- every day time highs is, is the same, that 32 degree morning is going to be that morning. Um, we were just looking at in there. There's a, a 13 degree drop. Oh, you're we looking we at this week. Yeah, on from Friday morning. morning. Oh, holy smokes! Actually, because we had we just talked about how it goes on Tuesday so, to Wednesday it goes 76, then down to 65, 64, 60, 61. But there is a morning on there on Friday morning, 37 degrees. And all the other mornings are in the 40s and 50s. Yes. So in like mm. that Sunday morning, because the front's coming through, that morning's going to be higher because there's clouds in the air in the fronts. So usually, oh, yeah. that's, the, usually that's the case anyways. Huh. And so kind of that leads into barometric pressure. Okay. Yes. So barometric pressure to me, it was something that, was that I followed thing. a little bit. Um, I do not follow the barometric pressure because okay. when you look at major weather taking place and you look at major temperature drop and the extreme weather is over, then it's a great time to hunt. Who cares what the barometric pressure is? So like on Thursday, uh, what did you say, Friday morning? That was yeah, a low? that was a really cold one. Cold so morning. let's say for some reason because Thursday or fr- uh, Saturday there's going to be a, a thunderstorm coming through. Then you might have a low barometric pressure, which in theory is bad to hunt on Friday when really you should be out in the woods on Thursday, on Friday because all that has taken place on Wednesday, Thursday, for example, to create a great sit on Friday regardless of the barometric pressure. Now, sometimes the barometric pressure is, if you just want a blank thing, but this will this will make you miss days, is if you just say... Um, when barometric pressure and temperature meet, the bucks will be on their feet. And what I mean by that is that was a friend, uh, previous client, Jared Archer. He gave me that quote, you know, talking about all this. But temperature is going down, barometric pressure is going up. You circle that to can't miss day. Hmm. But here's the thing. So let's say major front blows through on Sunday, Monday. Huge. Drops 25 degrees. And then on Tuesday... It's low temperature, calm, a little cloudy, and it just dropped 25 degrees, 20 degrees, 15 degrees. The major front blew through. It's a calm day. It's quiet. Maybe the winds are still 12 miles an hour. It doesn't really matter. Exceptional day to hunt. But if there's a major front coming through again, so you have a double front, you have it on Monday or Sunday and then Wednesday, that exceptional time in between is going to be a low barometric pressure. And people are going to say, don't go out and oh. hunt during a low pressure. Oh, oh. They're basing that all on the high brush. There's some models out there that purely go by high, high, high barometric pressure, and they're missing days completely. Also, the pressure is a really moving target. You know, winds are one thing, wind direction, wind speed. Barometric pressure can vary by a half day, day, depending on when the actual moisture is hitting. And so it's not a tangible. It's not something that, you know, people think, well, the deer can feel the barometric pressure. I don't think they can I don't think that's they're that sophisticated. I think they feel moisture change, wind change. I mean, I think they know when the wind's out of the east, it's hitting them on that side. I mean, I just think it's kind of like they hear an ATV coming and it's coming into the woods and then all of a sudden that ATV is going by their bedding area 
it only takes a couple times to hear that ATV a quarter mile away, and they know that that ATV is going to travel by that bedding area, so they just move back a little bit. The wind comes in from the east. All of a sudden, it's a big storm coming, dark clouds. I think this all just kind of clicks in their head because they're out there 365. Yeah, okay. And so the barometric pressure sometimes reflects great conditions, but it's just reflecting. It's not something you can look at and say, okay, because now when those two meet, Mm -hmm. you can circle it, count on it. But then there's other times in the forecast where the barometric pressure is low and it's very misleading. If you don't hunt that, you're really missing. And then there's other times where you could base your model on a high barometric pressure. There's sometimes, so these two meet right here and the pressure is going up, temperature's going. And then the second day, the temperature goes up eight degrees and the barometric pressure goes up. And there's some models that'll say that's just as high a value as this day right here. When all this took place, all the bad weather, all the severe weather, all the wind changes, that took place, created this. And then two days later, the barometric pressure is 10% higher, and people are saying, we got to go out in the woods then. Now it's, you know, high of 65 instead of a high of 57. Yeah, you're kind of like two days late. Yes. And mm. so if that model, based on barometric pressure, if you're following that or calculating that or putting it into algorithm, then it's going to be extremely misleading. Mm. Where the temperature is always good when it goes down. It's always good when the extreme weather breaks. It's always good when the wind speeds change. Mm-hmm. Good change for direction, hunting. change for speed. Good for hunting. Okay. So and so the barometric pressure, I, it's kind of, it's, it does reflect, but if you follow it, it's going to be misleading, good or bad. So, and maybe the answer to this is just no, but I was curious if there are any times when the temperature goes up that deer are maybe more likely to be on their feet or more comfortable? Because I know I've I, sat yeah. uh, some, some uber cold mornings, right? Yes. Or, or and, and maybe it's just related to severe weather when you see, like, you know, just uh, maybe that activity has been suppressed and now they're, they're able to get out. But, like, I mean, are, are, do you ever see times where it's like, you know, maybe got 10 degrees hotter? Yeah, I got 10 degrees warmer and maybe they're actually more comfortable or they're less hunkered down. See, that's a great question. And that's, you know, again in there, but it's um, when you, um, you guys I know I get more comfortable when I'm sitting there and it goes up 10 degrees. (laughs) Deer are very good at conserving energy, you know, and and meaning they're typically not if, um, let's say around here, a morning low that is minus seven. Mm-hmm. would be pretty pretty cold mm-hmm. during November, December. Um, let's say it's eight. It's pretty cold, especially if it's been, you know, double digits, 20s at night, and all of a sudden it's, that's at daybreak. So the coldest time of the day is at daybreak, right before the sun comes up. Right. So I find that typically they're back in their beds. They're conserving energy. They're not out in the food. But look at those days where you have a morning low like that, but then it's warming up after for several days. And so you have crunchy snow, and then all of a sudden by 10 a.m., it's already in the mid-30s, climbing up to 50 or 40s, and that happens a lot in the Midwest Mm -hmm. um, where you have bitter cold at night and then when the temperature changes. I love to hunt when there's soft snow late morning. Okay. When there's wet leaves late morning, when everything's frozen. In fact, I've gone in later during those times counting on the bucks being bedded down and deer in general being holed up when it's really cold. And then you approach on a non-bedding side, um, screened, Mm -hmm. ridged, you know, ridges, ditches, whatever you're you're getting in by, and you're getting into a stand that's not in view of that bedding area. You're getting near stand oaks, acorns, maybe even a small little food plot back in the woods that's near a bedding area that you saved and the deer using it during the daylight. And you're just waiting for it to warm up late morning. Okay. And so I really like that. You know, when it's because they're conserving energy. Um, I even believe a lot of times that, you know, it, it's different when there's food plots, food sources, heavy where they can just go nail it. A lot of times they're doing that right before dark. That's part of their patterns. Mm-hmm. But if you're hunting out on public land and you're hunting a big green briar patch down in southern Ohio and it's on top of a, a ridge system and that represents mixed in with some acorns, their main diet, then I find that, you know, in that case, if it's bitter cold, like I went on a mus- muzzleloader hunting one day in, in Ohio, it was on the fourth day. And a ranger park, the ranger came by and said, he thought out of the 60,000 acres, I was the only one in the woods. It was, I'm going out, it's two and it's supposed to be minus 10 by the time I get back to the truck. And, um, and I didn't see a deer. I was going out for an afternoon sit, but the best days to sit during that time probably would have been like 10 and 
10 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon. Warmest time of the day, you're a lot more active. I find they gorge during that time. And then they're laying up during the bitter cold, so they're circum- conserving energy, not burning that energy that, so they're, it, that they're consuming. It's essentially almost like there's a point where when generally it's hot and then it cools down, they right. like to move. Or generally when it's frigid and it warms up, they like to move. Almost like they just enjoy this equilibrium temperature that's somewhere between low stress, frigid and mega hot. Yeah. Like a low stress, oh, yes. stress, yeah, like just kind of like that tipping point where just, you're either going to be on one side of it or the other. Just like humans. You yes. know, I you know, love uh, it when it's like 65. Well, even seek and shelter. Like Mark said, you know, with, with where do you go when there's really bad weather? You know, yeah, you could hug a tree in 40 mile an hour wind, you know, winds and say, well, there's deer in the woods. There's always that chance that a big buck's going by. But if you have an area where you can get on the backside of some conifers, mm-hmm. Um, on the back side of a CRP field, switchgrass field, on the downwind edge, then a lot more likely the deer are going to be there, or on the, let alone the lee side of a, a ridge system. Yet another brain buster. I need to pay a lot more attention to the weather. <laughs> yeah, I likewise. Just, I think it uh, narrows down, you know, again, going back to playing poker in the deer woods, there's a lot of opportunity mm-hmm. that I think is either missed or not realized because... People have sat during poor times. And, yeah. You know, learning that less is more is is a really big, you know, really big part of it. Yeah. Marco, should we do last calls here? Yeah. I'm ready. Um, I am as well. My last call, the obvious one is just that, like you said, check weather out more, I think, is something that seems to make a lot of sense. Um, well, but and, I think and I'll... And I know one thing I'm going to check too. Yes, All Weather Whitetails. For those watching on YouTube, you can kind of see what it looks like here. This is Jeff's book, All Weather Whitetails, Forecasting Your Next Hunt of a Lifetime. Uh, check it out because basically a lot of the stuff that we talked about is sounds like it's right in this book here. Yes. Yeah, all the chapter titles and yeah, yep. going through. Yeah. Um, I will, because uh, I don't think I've had my quintessential car reference oh, on get this it podcast in. yet. I'll say that it is quite similar um, in that when working on vehicles, I found that uh, the worst days I have working on a car are when I show up in the garage and I have no idea what I'm going to be working on. And I just see, okay, I got to take that off. I got to, you know, whatever that eventually needs to come out. And I just start wrenching on stuff. And inevitably, I did it in the wrong order, I broke something, I forgot how to do something, so whatever, I'm stressed, I don't have the right tools, so I just end up stuck, and I spent a ton of time out there working on the car, but it was terrible. The best days in the garage are the ones where I did all my research before actually spending time out there, knew what tools I needed, knew what I was going to have to take off, what order to take it all off in the whole assembly, how to do it, the proper, you know, torque specs, all that stuff, and then just went and executed it. You didn't have to do it twice. Yes, or three or four or five <laughs> times. Yeah. And uh, my wife likes that more as well because yes. then I'm not gone for as long a period of time. Probably not burned out either. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You're not exactly. It's frustrated. Yeah. And, you, yeah. And, w- and when you get frustrated inevitably, then you start thinking to yourself, man, should I, I should just sell this thing. And of course, then the wife gets a little bit happy. She's thinking, oh yeah, maybe I'll sell it. I never do. But um, <laughs> 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 what you do, you get frustrated. And like you said, you get burned out after a while. So I can totally relate to that. And, and uh, yeah, anytime you go into something more proactively prepared, it, it just, it winds, everything winds up being better when you're more prepared to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, as much of a winging it personality as as I know uh, I am and you are as well, Mark. But that's my last call. Car man, reference, man. Mine's gonna be pretty much the same, Jim. And, and you know, Brittany is giving us a dirty look. I didn't want to look over there, but then I caught well, a, why a was glimpse she out a dirty of the look? corner of my eye. She's the she's the organized one of the bunch here. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. And by that, we are organized as well, right? When in doubt, if you know that you're not organized, just hire somebody who is, and they can just manage your life. Yes. Um, Jim, yeah, I mean, Jeff started talking in the beginning about work, work life, family, balance. Um, and, man, like, 
the, I don't want this to come out like I want to spend less time in the woods because I don't. But I mean, right. we we have we have factors in our lives that are just you know limiting you know at times when it when it comes to hunting or cars or anything else, right? So I'm I'm looking at this and I'm saying to myself, man, I can really use this information to my advantage to be more calculated, to uh, be more efficient, and pick days um, that are going to be you know those those high value days to hunt. And y- even talking about uh, vacation time, you might be able to take a day off if you pay attention to the weather and not take nine, a, week a week off. Yeah. And like I said, it's not because I don't want to spend time in the field, but also like... You just want to spend more meaningful time. In you want to spend meaningful t- time in the field. Uh, guess what? Uh, newsflash, I like seeing deer. And so if you pick those better days, you're probably likely to see more deer, have a more fun experience in the woods. At least, I, I mean, it's not entirely, but I do equate seeing deer and getting opportunities as having... Uh, fun and having an enjoyable experience, um, and and then you're gonna have more time to do some some other things as well, and and also buy other things. Another thing Jeff brought up that I really liked. This is gonna be the longest last call in history. Keep it up. But it's not necessarily even uh, picking these high value days, so you don't have to spend time in the woods. You'll be able to do some of those other things that you love. Go grouse hunting. Go fishing. Yes. Uh, yeah. So you're not necessarily like plugging it, in, plugging or, or replacing those other days with activities you don't want to do. You're just doing more activities, and I like more activities as well. Yeah, great. I just well done. I just replaced the time I was supposed to spend with the family with m- more hunting and fishing, Jim. Oh yeah, you did that. Anyway, well, I still like it. On to I'm you, done. Jeff. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people say that uh, I'm not a professional hunter. I can't hunt whenever I want. This concept and this formula was born out of, I had a young family, um, married, and I had a a real estate appraisal business through 2010 that was very intense. I had a hard time leaving for more than three to four days at a time. And because the banks were on me, I worked for the local banks in Munising. And um, it was, you know, when I went on vacation, I'd let them know I'm going on vacation because I didn't want them to give their orders to someone else. And so there was one week I finished 33 appraisals, which is a lot in the appraisal business in just one week. But then the next week we're going into town every day when we're in Pennsylvania at a cabin and um, we're, you know, I'm answering bank questions every day. And so I couldn't get away. And so I really had to maximize my time that I went hunting. And I quickly learned that um, going hunting one day, even if I had to drive seven hours to do it on the perfect weather day, the value was so much higher than going on that long weekend. And, you know, we did go to corn mazes, the cider mill, all that stuff that I could do with the family. And to me, it was a way to maximize my vacation time, my time away from the family. And this, that's what this was born out of. That's what it's all about. And so this was created for the average guy, the average hunter that could actually, you know, say, you know, with the realistic, expectation that if I manage my time this way, this is going to make my entire life easier. And guess what? Shoot more deer. And I'll have a better chance at my target box. Um, not going to burn out my lands and stand. And then that has a, a an effect towards the next year and mm-hmm. the next year. Mm-hmm. So you're building your maximum amount of efficiency on your land, whether it's on public land and it's a remote spot that you want to manage or on a small parcel that you own. And, and you're looking at, I want to build this towards the future too. And so it's not just about the future sits during hunting season. That's a big part of it and making sure you recognize those values, but it's building your land and your hunting for the following year too. And so to yeah. me, it was a more of a, not say a way of life, but it was a way to manage a, an extreme passion for hunting and make sure that you mm-hmm. get the most out of it. And it's for that average person that Maybe even if they have to look nine months in advance, you might have a, it might be better to take the last weekend of October and the first two weekends of November off and manage a long weekend each one and, and at least hedge your bets a little bit better that one of those or two of those weekends are going to be outstanding during that time than saying, okay, I'm just going to go all in seven days in a row, burn out my stands, burn out my family, my time. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. this really is to me for the average person because that's what it was born out of. And, it, and I, I was in banking from 1990 to 1998, and that's why I, I stepped over into appraisals um, in 98, 99, right around there. And um, 
I loved banking because they were open from seven to seven. And so that meant if I came in at seven in, in lower Michigan, I, they would let me use a half day of vacation and I could run up and either hunt a half day on a Wednesday or a half day on a Thursday morning. So Wednesday evening, Thursday morning, maybe just for a half day, it was an hour and 45 minutes to the land. So that's where this all, you know, really, even in the 90s. And that was a lot of the time because I couldn't be for that way that long. I couldn't, we stayed in a camper, slept in the car. I mean, we just didn't have the money to go to a hotel, food on the road. We brought food with us, you know, stole from parents' homes, <laughs> that kind of thing, <laughs> raided the kitchen and, and, uh, and left. And so it was really about, at that time, maximizing money and time. But, um, you know, and then now... I love to create 200 videos a year. I love to write 50 articles. Yeah. Um, I love to visit 90 clients. I actually, I'd rather visit 60 or working on that, but um, <laughs> it's, you know, and be away from home uh, less. But, you know, again, maximizing a lot of things, even though it's all white tail related, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, hunting's just the pinnacle of it. I, I need to choose that time wisely. Man, Makes perfect sense. That's uh, that ripple effect or that compounding effect that you just touched on, though, I hadn't really thought about that before. I mean, we've talked about, like, you're not going to burn out your stand. But, you know, if you're being, you know, super cal calculated like you are, and let's say you're successful and you harvest a buck, it didn't take you, you know, 20 days to do it, let's say, right? So, but by that, if you have multiple people hunting the same property, their odds go up to eventually, you know, take a buck because the place hasn't been messed with. Yeah, you're so, all playing yeah. the same game. Yeah, yeah. I and like then that. I look at over a 10-year period that you should shoot a highly unfair amount of target box compared to all your neighbors if you're doing it this way, and they're not. Because if they're burning out their stands during bad times and they're burning out their sits during bad times of the day, they're going at the wrong times, they're over hunting areas, then those mature box, to me, there's less than 5% of all lands that mature box call home during the daylight hours. Their window of movement is two to 400 yards around here during the day, almost the entire season. At night, it might be three square miles. So you're only looking to maximize those two to 300 yards, 400 yards per daylight. And even if that encompasses some of your neighbor's land, then when those neighbors encroach, they just move a little bit tighter. To me, mature box will tolerate the stress of each other during the daylight in close proximity of each other if their choice is to go out in, of that window that safe window as a four or five six-year-old buck and be exposed to hunting pressure mm. so there's yeah there's a ripple effect in a lot of different ways but um, well, i think you, bucks and you know annually can recognize your land as low risk okay that's what i was gonna say so are you saying kind of by like the fact that your neighbors may be applying you know more pressure yes. that your place is essentially even though you are hunting it is somewhat of a sanctuary Right, and that's why you can, they want to be. You know, I, you know, talked about hunting pressure is the lowest hole in the bucket, and that's why you can take an average parcel and do nothing with it. But if you maximize the hunting pressure, it's probably going to be better than your neighbors, even if they put tens of thousands of dollars into habitat improvements, because those habitat improvements, if they're hunting poorly, then they're attracting more deer to the land because of those improvements initially. But then when they spook all those deer, then they're educating more deer in the neighborhood because of those improvements. And so if you're the one parcel to the side that's doing nothing other than manage your hunting pressure, then to me, those mature bucks will go find that space. Mm -hmm. Those doe family groups will stay around that high quality habitat. But then you have that little window of little 20 acres or 10 acres where the deer call home or the mature bucks call home because they don't have a choice. They kind of get slotted into that low pressure area. And then that has yeah. a ripple effect for years to come because you're, you're managing a part-time buckard. You don't care where they're at in... Uh, May, June, July, August. I mean, frankly, you don't care where they're at in February, March, April. You just want them on your land during the most intense time of the, the season and the more pressure around you a lot of times, the more they're apt to stay on your land during the daylight hours. And yeah, they might leave during the middle of the rut, but that's yeah. a small window. Yeah. Man, I like it. Well, Jeff, thanks for joining us yeah, on this Yeah, thanks one. for having me. Um, yeah. Yeah, and for those who have questions, too, further questions from listening to this one, you want to ask Jeff something, too. I mean, Jeff, like you said, you uh, you have all kinds of conversations with people on all your social media platforms. Yes. So yeah, and I, and I would prioritize, I prioritize YouTube first and then Instagram, then Facebook. But, um, you know, I try to, I really try to answer 80, 90% of the comments on, we, we get dozens sometimes of questions a day on email. And mm -hmm. 
those are really tough because they don't help anybody else. And a lot of times it's several paragraphs long and I just don't have time to engage in that, mm-hmm. in that activity. So Diane sends them usually a, th- a thank you and appreciate it. And, but on social media, especially uh, YouTube with their quick questions and comments, those are, what I do is if I have 40 to answer or comment on, I pick all the shorter, shortest ones first. And then I start chipping my way down to the, you know, two sentence ones. Mm-hmm. And then some of those longer paragraph ones get left towards the end. But I really do try to answer all, all yeah. that I can and yeah. try to help as many as I can. That's a whole idea. Because if all this stuff, the books, the articles, the YouTube videos, if they're not helping anybody, then why do it? Yeah. Right. I mean, really, it's not. I just can't. And, and, and I'd watch other YouTube channels. I watch and. You know, I speak of the hunting public, we already talked, but it, you look at the amount of views and engagement. I mean, people love those guys, and it's because they offer something. And so if all this was dead, why do it? And so, so that's why I love engaging with people, and I love the feedback. And, and um, so you know, I encourage people, you know, White Tail Habitat Solutions, whether it's on YouTube or the website. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll get some more art- articles on the website, too, but or awesome. soon. But uh, sweet, been really focused on YouTube. We'll yeah. keep our eyes peeled for that. Hey, real quick, Jeff. I know we're looking at all weather whitetails right here. You got any other books coming out? Um, yeah, I do. Thanks for asking. One is um, it's so I have um, whitetails by design, food plot by design, mature bucks by design. Those are three bucks books that I put out in 2012, 14, 15. I have a kids book, um, turn time in the poachers. Even talk about ginseng thieves in there, and in uh, yeah. that book, which is ironic, but um. Um, and then this new book, I'm taking the the hunting chapters of those first four strategy books, I'm rewriting them to apply to public and private land, and ends up I'm cutting it from 79 chapters to 48 chapters, rewriting more portions of it. Some of them are not <laughs> rewritten as much, like all white tail, all weather white tail, because I just wrote that last November. And so I'm putting those all together in a coffee table size book, uh, new photos, diagrams, and it's you know, 48 chapters, it's going to be so a pretty long book. Um, but it's, it's going to be called uh, something along the lines of how to hunt deer, something simple like that. That's okay. uh, easy to find. Very Googleable. Yes. Very <laughs> <laughs> hitting oh. those, those, uh, key focus words. So I very much like Googleable phrases, but, uh, yes. I, I would say that 90% of it will apply to public and private land and just deer hunters in general, not much at all on food plots, habitat plantings, things like that, or, Hinge cuts, stuff like that. It's it's more, um, you know, how deer relate to cover, and how to hunt them, how to scout them, and awesome. uh, how to awesome. shoot them. Also, good deal. Keep your eyes yeah, peeled thanks. for that one. Check it out when it comes out. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for listening. As usual, we'll catch you next time. Happy yeah. hunting and shooting out there. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Jeff. Yeah, thank you guys. Always, uh, this is this is awesome. Love love coming to chat with you guys. So good luck this uh, weekend. Yeah, ah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll need it. <laughs> and everybody out there, yeah, thank uh, thank Jeff and your local weatherman for your next big buck. Exactly. <laughs> All right, bye, bye. Thanks, guys. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks everybody for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.